Hi everyone and thank you so much for joining us on Zoom on what is a beautiful sunny evening for this very important meeting on Britain's bus crisis, privatisation, poverty and human rights. We're going to be joined live from New York by Philip Alston, Basan Kawaja and Rebecca Riddell, authors of the brand new report, Public Transport, Private Profit, which we're going to paste the link to in the chat. I'm Ellie Harrison. I'm a volunteer public transport campaigner based in Glasgow, and I'm one of the co-founders of Get Glasgow Moving, a grassroots campaign founded in 2016 to demand a world-class, fully integrated and affordable public transport network for our region. I'm going to be co-hosting tonight's meeting with my friend and collaborator, Emily Yates, from the Association of British Commuters, and I'll just hand over to her now. Thanks, Ellie. I'm Emily Yates from the Association of British Commuters, a grassroots and voluntary group campaigning for equality and justice in public transport. We're proud to be part of a coalition of campaigns across the UK, fighting for the public control and ownership of buses. That includes our co-hosts here tonight, the Better Buses campaigns for West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire and Greater Manchester, Scotland's Poverty Alliance, We Own It and the National Pensioners Convention. And I know we're all hoping to see this coalition grow even further as a result of Philip Alston's report. So because this is such a large meeting, we have muted everybody's microphones so that we don't get any unexpected introductions. But after Philip and Bassam have spoken about the report, we're going to be taking a few questions. So firstly, from three key organisations that we've invited. Um, and then a few questions from the floor, as many as we can get through. So if you'd like to ask a question, then please feel free to type it in the chat as we go through. Uh, but we did want to start with a little bit of introduction. And I know people have been typing in the chat already, but if you could introduce yourselves, that would be fantastic. We're really interested to know where you're calling in from and what your role is. If you're a politician or a campaigner, or a journalist or just an interested bus passenger. We have invited lots of local councillors, MSPs, MPs, mayors and other policy makers to attend this evening's meeting. So I'd just like to say welcome to all those who've come along. We hope you'll find this interesting. Um, I can see some stuff starting to appear in the chat. People from Ches Cheshire, Gloucestershire, keep going. We'd love to see where you're all from, because we all know that the, the consequences of the disastrous policy of bus deregulation affect people in all corners of Britain. And over the last 10 years, the added strain of austerity has led to drastic cuts to bus services all over the country, which has just compounded decades of declining ridership on our buses. In Philip Alston's words, Britain's extreme form of privatisation has been a 30 year masterclass in how not to run a bus service. We think this could be the most important bus report in years, and it couldn't have come at a more crucial time for both England and Scotland. Both countries are now at risk of getting locked into bus deregulation for yet another generation. And that's due to government policies that tie council funding with bus partnerships instead of public control. In England, that's the National Bus Strategy and in Scotland, it's the Bus Partnership Fund. Both of these have key deadlines over the course of the next eight months. So there's a very small window of time to take action and this could really be our last chance to do so. And this is why Philip Alston's report is so valuable. It's very clearly coming out against bus partnerships, concluding that our governments should explicitly reject them and support councils in moving towards public control and ownership instead. It also recommends legislating for minimum service and frequency levels, creating for the first time a statutory right to transport. The report breaks new ground in approaching public transport provision as a human rights issue and giving a voice to the people who've been most affected and excluded by transport poverty. Most shockingly of all, it concludes that the UK could be in serious breach of its human rights obligations. 
That's in relation to three international conventions, as well as failing to implement the socio-economic duty of the Equality Act 2010. The report has already made a huge impact since it was published on Monday. Some of you may have already read it, we're hoping so. And we truly hope that this scrutiny on the global stage will finally force our governments to take action. So at the end of tonight's session, we're going to be asking you all to help put pressure, um, put pressure on by sending the report to your local politicians and asking them to read it and to act on the findings. So I'm now going to introduce Philip Alston, who I hope has now joined us on the Zoom call. I'll give him a minute to get ready just by saying that it's a great honour to have him with us this evening. He is um, a human rights lawyer and the co-chair of New York University's Centre for Human Rights and Global Justice. He is the former UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, serving in that role for six years. And in 2018, he made an official visit to the UK and wrote a very high profile report for the UN on poverty in this country, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So thank you so much to Philip for joining us. Hopefully he's here and I'm going to hand over to him now. Uh, thanks, Ellie. Um, I'm, I'm here at least, if not there. <laughs> um, many thanks for uh, organising this event. Thanks to you and, uh, and Emily for the introduction. Um, the background to this report, as you said, is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, two um, memorable moments during my trip to the UK uh, in 2018. One was a meeting actually in Bristol, where I met with um, a pretty wide selection of people living in the English countryside. And the most important issue that they raised very insistently was public transport, in particular buses. And they made the point that their lives had been made extremely difficult in a great many ways as a result of the bus service that came out of the policy of privatization. I then met in London uh, quite a few days later with a junior treasury minister and I raised the issue with him and he looked at me as though I was from Mars and said, but, but transport's got nothing to do with the government. It's privatized. And so that sort of encapsulated it. Uh, the notion that it's not the role of the government to ensure one way or another that essential public services are provided to enable people to live in dignity, to live effectively, to live productively and to live happily. The report that we've put out deals, uh, or at least raises three separate issues that I want to talk about briefly. First, obviously, is the state of the bus system. Second, the human rights consequences of that system. And thirdly, the broader debate over privatization. Before I get into the substance, just let me say that the report was written by my colleagues uh, Bassam Hawaja and Rebecca Riddell uh, from New York University uh, in cooperation with me. Uh, and they did an enormous amount of research, uh, speaking with a great many, not just experts and passengers, but members of the general public who had very significant experience in relation to the workings of the system. So first of all, the question is why focus on buses? That'll be pretty obvious to most of the people on this call. Um, four and a half billion journeys per year in Britain, the majority of all journeys on public transport. More people go to work by bus than on any other form of public transport. 
And of course, buses are not operating in isolation. They contribute hugely to the economy. They alleviate poverty. And as we'll see later, have major climate implications. What's the current state of the system? Well, you know that better than I do, but you can be sure that decision makers in London are not intimately familiar with the real situation because they simply don't depend on buses. What we know is that the system is fragmented, multiple owners, all competing with one another, separate ticketing systems, maps, schedules, and so on. They don't cross subsidize routes. Uh, there are many cuts. Services often unfrequent, unreliable. Routes are often cut with little warning and there's no minimum service frequency. We know that. The statistics tell the story almost sufficiently on their own. 3,000 routes have been cut in the past decade in England alone. England, fares have only gone up four times since 1987, 402% since 1987. Ridership, it's been a huge success, the privatization initiative. It's down 38%. In Scotland, fares up 160%, ridership down 43%. You couldn't get worse statistics. Where do human rights come into the picture? That might puzzle some of you. What's this got to do with rights? Well, in fact, having access to public transport that works, that is reliable, that is affordable, is crucial to exercising virtually all of our human rights in a meaningful way. When we talk about social rights, we think about the right to work, right to get there, the right to get there on time, the right to be able to get there in a reasonable time, the right to health. It's great having an NHS, but if you can't afford the bus to get to it, or if it only runs once a day, or uh, it's otherwise unaffordable, then the NHS ain't much use to you. The right to education, kids who need to get to school, adults who are doing further education, all rely on the bus. If we take civil and political rights, the traditional rights, the right to vote, the right to participate in political parties, the right to freedom of religion, the right to assemble, all of those are totally dependent on for, for lower income people, this is. Of course, it goes without saying that this whole report is not of particular interest to the well-off. The well-off have their cars. They don't care about the bus system. It's people who are less well-off and obviously, most importantly, people who are really low income or those living in poverty who are affected dramatically. And all of these rights are significantly impinged upon. There's then what we might call cultural rights, just the right to keep in touch with your family and your friends, the right to go to football matches, the right to go to bingo clubs, the right to go to any form of sort of community activity, all dependent on buses. Is there a human right to transport? Well, there's an academic debate over that, but it's a pretty silly debate because the bottom line is that without reasonable access to reliable transport, most of the human rights that I've mentioned are rendered pretty useless. The role of privatization is obviously central to our report. And as we say, it's delivered a service that is expensive, unreliable, and dysfunctional. Um, we've put together a chart, which is stunning. It's on, I think, page nine of the report and was also issued separately. But if you compare the statements that the Thatcher government made back in 1984 
uh, with all of the promises of the great future that privatization would bring, with the government's own report on the bus service in England in 2021, you'll see that every one of the claims of the privatizers is shown to be wrong, is shown to have failed. In economic terms, which becomes extremely important because so much of the justification for privatization is economic, what we see is that the operators are doing nicely, thanks very much, good profits, and where there are problems, they're subsidized by the government. So the government in fact provides 42% of funding for bus services in England, despite the privatization. The public is actually therefore subsidizing very generous profits drawn by the private operators. The broader significance of this study is one that I really want to emphasize before we finish. Privatization has become a sort of mantra and the media, many of us, accept this assumption that, well, a privatized service is going to be more efficient. It's going to be more, uh, it's going to be better for the government in terms of the budget. It's going to be better for the economy and we're all going to end up with better services. The truth is that there is a huge gap between that rhetoric and the reality. There is very little attempt in most areas to make what we should think of as evidence-based policy. Rather than saying, well, of course, privatization is better. The challenge is to see what the appropriate mix is that's going to produce the best results, not for the government's friends in private business, but for the average user of the bus service and thus for the British economy. There are many implications of this study for other sectors. Many people have expressed concern to me about the National Health Service, for example. Well, the recipe is pretty clear. What's been done in the UK and in many other countries is straightforward. You let a service run down. You starve it of resources. You don't pay the staff decent wages. The quality of the service deteriorates and the government then says, oh my goodness, there's only one solution. It's privatization. And that's going to solve all these problems. Privatization invariably leads to the story that we tell in this report on buses. So the report is of much broader significance. Two final points and then I'll finish and hand over to my colleague Bassam. First, if we really care about climate change, we've just had another delightful dramatic thunderstorm in New York on a summer's day in a summer that I haven't seen the likes of in 20 years of living in New York. We know what's going on around the world. Climate change is having a dramatic effect. The buses are a key part of it, but the government needs to ensure not just a strategy for decarbonization, but that services are available that are going to attract riders. And that's what's going to cut down on emissions and contribute to the fight against climate change. Its current policy is the perfect in-between approach. It leaves the privatization system and all of its problems nicely in place, but it introduces a range of measures that it says will in fact address those problems when actually it won't. So in other words, it's the perfect half measure which will actually achieve remarkably little. The government hasn't been prepared to bite the bullet that what is needed is essentially public control over the system. Not public ownership necessarily, 
but public control to ensure that there is an integrated, effective, equitable system that is available for everyone in England, Wales and Scotland. I'll leave it at that. I look forward to questions and I'll turn it over to Basam Hawaja who did a, an absolutely brilliant job in doing the research for this report. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, I see we're nearing the half hour mark, so I'm actually going to keep this pretty brief and make sure we have a lot of time for questions because I know I'm already seeing really good questions in the chat and I'd love to get into that. Um, I think, first of all, my name is Bassam Khawaj. As Philip said, I was one of the authors of the report. I'm a human rights lawyer uh, here in New York. Um, as an outsider, I mean, to be honest, I've been pretty stunned with the findings that we've, that we've come up with. Um, I think most people have an idea that the UK is a very wealthy country with excellent services, and it's been pretty horrifying to realize the extent to which people have been abandoned across the country to an essential service like this that just doesn't work at any level. Um, we, as Philip said, um, really set out to see with this report, what is the impact of privatization when a government takes an essential service like this and, and gives it over to the private sector and says, here, run this for profit, what impact does that have? Because it's a pattern we're seeing you know, in the UK, certainly, but all over the world, there's a real trend towards this. And there's not a whole lot of evidence-based research into what happens. And in that sense, this is really a perfect case study because you have almost 40 years of evidence about how this has gone. And we have the government in 1984 with their predictions of what happened and the current government, Boris Johnson's government, and, and their assessment of, of the situation now. And as Philip said, it's pretty stark to see in the government's own words, this recognition of failure even if they're not actually deciding to move in a different direction with it. Um, so there's a few points that I want to make uh, just to kind of wrap up what Philip said. I think the first is there's this mantra that we've heard a lot from people around the country, but also from the bus operators that we've reached out to, and that it's, you know, it doesn't really matter who runs the service as long as the services run well. As long as you have a good, reliable service that runs on time, public, private, that's kind of out of the question, and your report is, is off base, and you're uh, entire theory here is wrong. And I think we want to push back really strongly on that. I mean, I think what, what we found with this report is it, there, you know, the very act of running something for profit has a fundamental effect on how it is run. Uh, when you take a service like this and say, well, we need to make a profit out of it. We're going to run the routes that are profitable and anything else is going to get cut. That means that if you live on one of those routes that is not profitable, but is necessary for you to get to your hospital, um, that has a massive impact on your life. And so the very act of making those decisions based off what is profitable uh, is fundamental here. And it's not something that we can just kind of think of as an afterthought. Um, there's a couple, I have three points I really want to take out of the report's findings. I mean, the first is, as Philip said, it's just, it's, this is not working. Uh, it, it's clear. I mean, for me personally, as, as a researcher coming from outside, it is pretty remarkable to see this kind of consensus from, you know, within the government, within transport experts, within, you know, various different institutions that have all put together excellent reports on this. Uh, there's an enormous body of evidence that isn't really contested that, you know, since 1985, when the, when the Transport Act was passed, this has all been going in the wrong direction. And it's pretty striking to see that. It's not often you get that kind of consensus. Um, the second is that people's rights are on the line. I mean, we really spoke with people around the country to, to get a sense of beyond the numbers, what this looks like for people's lives. And the stories we heard were pretty horrific. I mean, there are people who have literally lost jobs because their bus route was cut and they spent years then trying to find another job that they can access. Uh, one story that, that sticks with me is, is Phil, who, who talked about his job search, where he was reliant on the bus. And, and a number of people said stories like this, where because you're limited to where the bus takes you, that limits what kind of job you can apply for. Because obviously, if you cannot get to work, you cannot apply for that job in, in good faith. Um, and so he started restricting what he was looking for based on where the bus would get him. And the Department of Work and Pensions looked at his job search and said, well, this is inadequate and, and you're clearly not taking this seriously enough and, and cut his benefits at a time when he was relying on them to get by. Um, we've heard of stories from people who can't get to the hospital in time. We've heard of stories of people who um, just trying to pay cash to, to, to bus companies are being turned down and made to walk to the hospital. Um, so really across the board, I mean, you know, all the way from getting to a football match down to getting to your job, uh, this has had an enormous impact on people's rights. And it, it's really, it's not a, it's not a trivial thing. Um, and then finally, it's, en it's enormously expensive. I mean, the, the way that public systems work is you run profitable routes, you run unprofitable routes, and then use the profits to subsidize the others. 
um, private companies pull money out of the system in, in, in the form of dividends for their shareholders, and that has a cost to it. It means that the government has to step in with additional subsidies. Um, as we've heard, that amounts right now to billions of dollars a year. It's a massive amount of money that goes into the system. That's not a bad thing. The government should be spending money on public transportation, but it's a problem when that's going to line the pockets of companies who are pulling it out for their own dividends. Um, and so, and we've really seen that in COVID where during the good times, the buses get to make profits. And as soon as you hit something like a pandemic, the government has to step in and is clearly still on the hook to ensure those profits. And so we've seen hundreds of millions of pounds in additional funding going to the, to the bus operators this year. Um, the UK is also unique in that there, there's a lot of different comparators within the country that, that show what could be possible. The system in London is highly regulated. It works phenomenally well by most accounts. You have some holdover uh, municipally owned private operators in Nottingham and Reading and, and Edinburgh, who again, by all accounts, do a much better job because they're not pulling those dividends out in the form of profits and you know, are much more of a community-based public service. Um, and then you see across Europe, you know, the, where the regulation is the norm. And so this is not, you know, this does not have to be this way. The, the UK is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It can afford a good service if it actually wanted to prioritize it. Thankfully, after years, if not decades of neglect, the government is starting to, to look at this again and, and, and to give it some attention, even though we're highly critical of the fact that their, their new proposal leaves the deregulated process in place. And so... You know, I think there's a moment here. We've been uh, just massively impressed with the organizers doing work around this all the way from Glasgow to Newcastle, uh, to Greater Manchester, uh, to uh, Yorkshire. And so we would love to uh, be here to support you on this. Um, I think there's, there's an enormous potential as the UK is feeling the pressure from this to actually change the direction of, of their current policies. And so, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're delighted to, to be able to, 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 to contribute this research uh, we're supporting this battle and uh, we're happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Bassam. And to Philip, of course, I can see a virtual round of applause coming in. Thank you so much. So we're, we're now going to try and uh, fit in as many questions as we can for the last half hour of the meeting. We're going to start with the three organisations that we've invited specifically to respond to the presentations and to, to ask a question. So. We've got the CPRE, which is the countryside charity based in England. We've got the Poverty Alliance based in Scotland. And then finally, the National Pensioners Convention. And then afterwards, Matthew from Better Buses for West Yorkshire has been going through the chat and will have painstakingly pulled out um, lots of questions for us to pose to Philip and Bassam. So first up, I'd like to introduce Chris Hinchcliffe from the CPRE, the Countryside Charity, who have also just published their own excellent report on rural bus services, which some of you may have read. So if Chris is here, we'd lovely, love you to unmute your mic and come in and ask your question. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Brilliant, fantastic. Uh, that was um, fantastic to listen to those brilliant speakers and to hear so much. Uh, so many different things that we agreed with as CPRE, the countryside charity. And brilliant to see so many people on this call who are all pulling in the same direction on this really important issue. So uh, my question is, because they're not commercially profitable enough to support regular bus services, many rural towns and villages across England have been left to become transport deserts, where residents have actually no alternative to driving for the journeys they need to make in their day-to-day -day lives. Do you think that the use of regulation to guarantee in every village, every hour bus service, as in North Hesse in Germany, or the similar approach in regions of Switzerland, where communities of just 300 people are guaranteed an hourly service from 6 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week, 365 days a year, do you think that can be a template for the way forward here in England? Could you hear that okay, Bassam? Yeah. Yeah, I can start and then Philip can fill in. Um, Chris, first of all, thank you for the excellent report. I think it was phenomenally useful. And as you see, we, we, we cited it in, in our report uh, as well. Uh, it's just great to see that kind of comparative research because it shows what is actually possible if you decide to put money into your system. Um, I think the rural issue is, is one that's really central to all of this because it shows the limits of the current system. Uh, you know, under the current system where things are, 
either you know need to be profitable or, or local authorities have to have the money to subsidize services, uh, rural areas are just getting left out completely. And it was pretty shocking to, for us to see the extent to which uh, you know, from the parliamentary level all the way down, people just do not have answers for this question. They, you know, there's no, it's really just been left out to dry. And the government's uh, latest strategy for England really just kind of sidestepped the question entirely. Uh, MPs that we've spoken to have basically put their faith in new technologies and driverless buses and kind of nonsense like that, as if that's going to be coming around the corner anytime soon. Um, and so for us, it's really a perfect case study of, you know, this is you, you, this is something that you need to be able to put money into, that this is not something that just can be run for profit um, and that we need to abandon this idea that a bus needs to make money to be viable. Um, we, you know, again, we've seen across, you know, Europe, this is certainly not the case. Uh, and it was striking to me the extent to which that message has become embedded. I mean, a lot of people we spoke to, even in rural areas, we said, well, what would you like to see? And they said, well, there's nothing we can do. It's not viable. And the government says it has to be viable. And you know, that's the impact of, again, close to four decades of, of privatization and, and running buses in this with this uh, approach. But that's certainly not the only way that, that you can do this. And, and again, countries all around the world have figured out how to run a rural bus service. So it, it's pretty unacceptable that the UK government has, you know, basically thrown up its hands and said, well, there's nothing we can do. Is there anything you want to add to that, Philip, or should we hear from Susie at the Poverty Alliance? Um, I'm uh, happy to add some comments later, but I'm, I'm more interested now in hearing from uh, from others. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, so next up we've got Susie Merning, who's Campaigns Officer at Scotland's Poverty Alliance, who have also just launched a public transport campaign. So over to you, Susie, if you want to unmute. Thanks, Ellie, and hi, everyone. So from discussions we've had with individuals with lived experiences of poverty and with organisations from across Scotland, the Poverty Alliance submitted evidence to the Scottish Government's National Transport Strategy Consultation. And just last month, we published a report commissioned by Transport Scotland, looking at the relationship between transport and child poverty. And what came out of both tells the same story that's told throughout the report, which is that inadequate public transport can have profoundly negative impacts on people's lives and that there's a lack of accountability for the damage that's done. And back in March uh, this year, as Ellie mentioned, we launched our Everyone Aboard campaign, which calls for free concessionary bus travel to be extended to everyone who's receiving universal credit and other low income benefits and to all young people under 25. And we focused on the cost element of bus travel for these groups because we know rising fares are just too high for those living on low incomes who a depend on buses the most and b are the least able to shoulder the burden of these rising costs. So our question is whether you think reducing or eliminating transport costs would be sufficient to reduce poverty or whether public control or re-regulation of buses is an essential part of the picture and if so why? So again I mean this is it all does come back to privatization because it's which you know it'd be great to see the government put a lot more resources into making transport affordable and free for people who actually need it like those on benefits I mean it's one of the recommendations we make in the report um, but as with the uh, decarbonization plan that Philip mentioned, climate change, it's not enough to make, you know, if the buses don't go where you want to get to, right, if the buses don't work for you, the fact that they're free is meaningless. We spoke with many people who have concessionary passes who are over the age of 66 in, in the UK, sorry, in England, over the age of 60 in some of the other places. Um, and they, you know, say, well, I would, you know, I have a bus pass. I don't use it because it doesn't go where I want to. Uh, I can't use it to get to, you know, the grocery store. I can't use it to get my food. I can't use it to go to see loved ones. And so what's the point in having this free concessionary pass if the system doesn't actually work for me? And so it's clear just based on the failure of the system that it's not going to be enough just to make it accessible. You really have to completely change the entire way that it's structured to make it actually um, an attractive option. So again, similar to climate, it's not enough just to decarbonize buses to say that, well, we're going to run a zero emissions fleet. You have to actually pull people out of their cars and onto the buses. And to do that, you cannot, running it under the current system will not accomplish those goals. Brilliant answer. <laughs> um, Philip, do you want to add anything or? Uh, I think the only thing I'd say um, is a much more general point, uh, and that is that the bus system of, is, of course, symptomatic of the overall approach that the government is adopting. Uh, the 
economic and social policy is basically every person for herself. Uh, in other words, uh, the government has no responsibility in this area uh, or in many others, and we're going to let the chips fall wherever, uh, rather than seeing that it has an obligation to uh, conduct its management of the economy in such a way that it distributes the benefits fairly and equitably. And buses are just one of the key points. Uh, but they are so symbolic in a way, uh, because just as people are being, just as huge cuts have been made uh, at the local council level, uh, while councils are then expected to cop the cost of a lot of the uh, bus passes for the elderly and so on, just as all other elements of the social safety net have been cut, so too have bus services been allowed to degenerate into a shadow of what they should be. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, we're going to move on to Fran Postlethwaite now, who's going to be representing the National Pensioners Convention. And Fran's also involved in lots of local public transport campaigns. She's going to ask our final question before we get over to ones from the floor. Uh, thanks, Ali. Uh, and I want to say on behalf of the MPC uh, that this report is extremely welcome, uh, particularly from our point of view, the repeated emphasis on how older people are badly uh, impacted by the failure of our bus system. Um, Bassam just referred to the fact that, you know, it's all right having a bus pass, but if you've got no decent bus services, it's not a lot of use to you. So we need fundamental change in the way that he said. Um, as Ali said, I'm, I'm involved in, a, in um, a local campaign in South Yorkshire uh, about, uh, you know, improving better buses. And like other local campaigners, we're arguing constantly with our regional transport authority that they should take control by deciding to go for the franchising option. The argument we keep getting back is it, it's far too expensive. It, to establish and run a franchise system. We can't do it, we're facing cuts, and therefore we're gonna go for the enhanced partnership, which is the other. So I think it's great that this report actually talks about putting pressure on the national government. It's, it's the national government, they need to take action to push for real change and to provide the necessary funding. And the question I'd like to ask is, do you have specific examples of governments elsewhere where the government generally has embraced neoliberalism, so they're not revolutionary governments or even necessarily left-leaning governments, but yet they've recognised that public transport should not be delivered over to private companies as a profit-making enterprise, but should be in the public control of the authorities. Thanks. Um, thanks, Fran, for that question. I mean, I think, and it's great to hear you raise the response you're getting because it's so important that we, we address this, these arguments head on. Um, and the report acknowledges this. Um, what we describe the history since deregulation has basically been a slow crawl back from that position, but without actually making the hard decisions that are necessary. And one example has been the current franchising processes that have been introduced. I mean, they're really appear, to, at least to us as outsiders, um, to be intended not to be used. Um, they are so bureaucratic, they are so difficult, the barriers to actually getting through them are so onerous that it's not surprising that not a single authority has been successful yet. Um, though we're quite encouraged by the fact that Greater Manchester has, has finally made, declared its intention and other authorities seem to be following suit. Um, and so we need a change there. It cannot be left up to individual authorities to brave through this process by themselves uh, left out to dry under threat of lawsuit and campaigns from private operators uh, with enormous kind of financial implications to actually switching the system out, especially as many state and, and you know, resources were sold off during privatization itself, right? And so um, it's, a, it's a profoundly unfair process for, from the perspective of local authorities. And we really, what we've called for is um, for political and financial support from the central government to local authorities who are pursuing franchising, um, a reformation of what the process that they have to actually go through and even specific teams set up with, um, you know, the expertise and the, and the resources to be able to support them through this process. Uh, we want to see the national government actually throw its weight behind Greater Manchester to, to create a blueprint of how you can actually go about this process instead of just kind of watching casually from the sidelines. Um, and so there's a lot of work there to be done to put pressure on the national government, even as 
it's going to be up to a lot of local authorities to do this, you know, uh, one by one. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, an example of, of, of places that have done this differently, I mean, I think in New York, where Philip and I are calling in from, is possibly the perfect example where, you know, we live in a, a very capitalist country where most things are privatized. We uh, look at your NHS with jealousy. Um, but, you know, in New York, we have a public transport system that is, uh, you know, fully public and runs at a loss and in many instances is credited for building the city. Um, and, you know, we have subways that run 24 hours a day that don't make a profit. And that's a fine. That's a good thing um, because people use them to get wherever they need to go. And it's recognized as incredibly important for the viability of the city. Uh, anyway, I'll start, stop there and, and turn it over to Philip if you have anything to add, Philip. Uh, just to say, uh, to, to add that there's one other country, Fran, that you might have heard of that does things uh, differently. It's called London. Great answer. Okay, so we've got um, about 10 minutes left for questions. So I'm hoping that Matthew has been carefully sifting through the chat and is now going to come in and pose a few more questions to Bassam and Philip. Maybe we'll take a few. Um, if you want to note them down and then you could respond to a few at a time. Brand, well, thank you everyone for sending your questions in. There's such a great selection to be choosing from. So sorry if I've not managed to um, pull yours out. Um, from Chris Gibson, we've got, um, uh, I think, a really quite important question, particularly in light of um, the human rights element of the report, uh, which is the question, has there been a disproportionate impact on women due to the bus uh, privatization we've seen over the last uh, four decades? Um, if folk are happy for me to give uh, a second question at this point, um, I'll also ask um, from Karen, is there any evidence about the cost and effectiveness of completely free public transport and, and how does this relate in to the findings of the report? Philip, do you want to go? Do you want me to go? Um, so on women, um, yes. I mean, it's it, we didn't even try to do a separate section on women just because um, there it's so embedded in every uh, you know population that we looked at, whether it's people with disabilities, people living in rural areas, people in poverty. I mean, in all of those, women are disproportionately affected, and and women also, and particularly older women, are some of the highest you know users of the buses in the UK, and so all of the problems that we've spoken about have had a massive disproportionate impact on them. Um, and again, it's something that the government, you know, has recognized, but has not really done a whole lot to uh, do, you know, to, to, to actually to address it. I mean, one issue that has raised, been raised over and over again is this issue of concessionary bus passes, particularly for older women. And we spoke to a number of people who, you know, were, thought they were going to get a, a bus pass at age 60 and be able to travel for free. And, and the government has change that and now they have to wait until you know several more years and the um you know the number of people we spoke with who kind of expressed um outrage at the inequality and kind of unfairness of a system where you know if you live in london if you live in scotland you get a bus pass at the age of 60 but if not then you have to wait many more years um it was, was pretty stark it was you know it was it was very powerful to hear that that kind of anger about the current system and i don't think the government has addressed that adequately um the matthew what was the second question um, it was around the cost and effectiveness of um, free free buses in this context. Yeah, I mean, so it's not something we looked into in, in huge detail. I mean, we are calling for uh, free free passes for people, you know, again, above, above certain ages, for the government to consider free passes for younger people, um, and especially for people who are on benefits and looking for work uh, and in kind of refugee or asylum situations, just because uh, it, it seems like a no-brainer. I mean, there is enormous evidence that you know, people in those situations will benefit massively from being able to use the bus for free. It will have a big impact on the economy. Um, and again, you know, the idea of asking someone who uh, you know, is, is living on an asylum allowance, who's not allowed to work in the country and has literally just a few pounds per week uh, to pay five, six, seven pounds for a bus ticket is, is pretty criminal, um, as is expecting someone who is, is looking for work, who has very limited impact. As the government claims that there are options for people who are looking to work to get funding, but everyone we spoke with basically said that it was too difficult to go through those uh, processes, that they needed too much information, too much detail, it took too much time. And I think none of them actually were able to, cl to claim those benefits to be able to get, uh, you know, job seekers allowance uh, to cover their transport. And so 
uh, it's currently, I mean, again, it's a system that's really not working uh, at all for those people. Probably got time for another couple of questions, Matthew, if you've got some. Yes, definitely. So um, I believe we're joined this evening by Paul Sweeney, MSP, and um, Paul has, has brought to, to the attention of the authors um, the response of Paul White, uh, director at the uh, privatised um, bus lobby Confederation for, for Passenger Transport in Scotland. Um, and so I'll, I'll read um, a quote from, from these folk and, and then we're, we're seeing to the, what, what response um, uh, Philip and Vassan maybe have to, to that. Uh, so here it is. Um, while CPT shares the uh, desire of the report for a strong public transport system, we do not believe that the report provides a full or fair picture of bus operations in Scotland. There are a myriad of factors that impact upon bus services and fares uh, beyond who owns or operates the vehicles. Uh, research indicates that three quarters of the factors that influence uh, bus pat patronage um, are out of the operator's control. Among these are ever worsening congestion and lack of bus priority. Um, so how, how does that sit with the findings of the report, Bess and Philip? Thank you. Philip, do you want to take them? Um, well, yeah, just a couple of comments and then, yep. uh, then you should come in. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, um, <clears throat> I think um, in terms of the earlier question, just very briefly about cost benefit analysis, uh, it is extremely important for, to see a public bus service as part of the broader economy. It's true that our focus is on initially people living in poverty and then low income people. But in fact, a proper functioning, reliable public bus service is crucial to the economy as a whole. And so I am very confident that if a serious cost benefit analysis was done, it would show that there would be great economic benefits in the government taking control of the system and making sure that it does bring into the uh, full economic system, a whole range of people who are currently marginalized. Uh, but that's not the sort of study that governments that are more concerned to protect private sector profits than to uh, th th than to serve the broader public uh, is really uh, are really prepared to uh, to engage in. Uh, in terms of the comments that uh, Paul Sweeney uh, quotes, I saw that in the chat. Uh, first, it, we would of course be delighted to see the research that uh, shows that uh, three quarters of the uh, factors are out of the control of the bus operator. Let's by all means scrutinize that very carefully. Secondly, of course, it's true that there are other factors in making a bus service ever more attractive. But if you have extraordinarily expensive buses, if they are unreliable, then people are of course not going to use them. And that also then reduces the arguments for making special arrangements for the buses. So I think it's also true that in the future, as we focus more on the climate change and other implications of buses, uh, it is going to be important to address some of the issues that uh, are raised in terms of improving priority access for bus services uh, and so on. But I think that's essentially in light of our report, and I'll leave this to Bassam, a red herring because the report overwhelmingly makes the case uh, that there are other factors that have turned passengers away from the system. Yeah, um, so we wrote to the five major bus companies in the UK. Uh, CPT re responded to us on behalf of Go Ahead. Uh, they did not send us that study that they're quoting in the media. Um, you know, I think we came into this report very honestly looking at what is going to be the impact of privatization, right? What, what impact has it had? Because there's a cost of privatization, right? Pro they're, they're, that's the deal. The, the companies pull profits out of the system and in return, it's supposed to be delivering a better system, a more efficient system to use technology to make it better. There's all kinds of claims that were made 
Um, and again, all of the, if there is evidence that they have done that, we were delighted to receive it and to review it. And again, we, you know, we reached out to all these companies. I have not seen any evidence that those claims hold up. I mean, it seems like the system they're running is more expensive than a public one would be. It's fragmented. It doesn't work. It has led to massive cuts in roots, all because again, by design, it's based off of what is profitable and not what the public actually needs. And so um, I, I would be delighted to see this system, but uh, to see this report, but I, I, I really doubt that, that, that I'd be very convinced by it. And, you know, the, the other argument here is that, you know, this report is not a, an anti-private operator report. I mean, there are a lot of the bus companies, I think, do a good job under the circumstances with, with their system. It's just, you know, this is about the government and the system that has been imposed on the UK, right? The private operators are doing what private companies do. They're trying to make a profit. I'm not here to, to blame them for that. I'm here to blame the government for leaving the public to a system that only works based off of profit. I think that is the fundamental thing to keep in mind here. Um, and that's why private partnerships and things like that will not work because it's not just about reforming what a private operator is doing. There's a limit to what that'll achieve. The only way you actually get to a solution here is by fundamentally reconfiguring how the full system works and, and not actually running it based only on what the market will bear. I couldn't agree more. Um, absolutely amazing to hear in more detail from you both. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you everyone for all the great questions. Um, and a huge thank you to Philip, Assam and Rebecca for this excellent report, which I think is giving us an invaluable campaigning tool at the time we need it most. It's now vital that we build on the momentum we've seen this week as there's a very short time frame in which to influence government policies. Ellie? I'm just going to say a little bit about what's happening in Scotland at the moment. Transport Scotland is currently consulting on the bus powers in the Transport Act, which was passed in 2019, but it's been delayed because of COVID. But powers in that act do give local authorities um, the options for public control and public ownership of bus services. So there's a link in the chat to this consultation. The deadline is on the 6th of October. And we'd like to encourage you all to respond to this consultation, to let your um, elected politicians know that it's happening. And basically, we need to do what Bassam said, and that is to make sure that there is funding and support behind these powers to make them feasible and affordable for local authorities to use. There's no point the powers being there unless they can be used. But we also need to fight back against the Scottish government's completely ill-conceived bus partnership fund, which is a scheme that is currently forcing local authorities into bus partnerships because that's the only way they can get funding at the moment. So that's a disaster. We need to expose what's going on there and make sure that new powers of public ownership and control are actually workable and affordable and backed up with funding. So please respond to that consultation before the 6th of October. So Wales has actually had a better approach than England and Scotland so far. They tied their COVID funding to increased public control and they're preparing new legislation on buses that we hope will be introduced to the Senate later this year. If you're in Wales, it's a great time to pressure the government to go all in for public control and ownership and avoid making the mistakes we're seeing in England and Scotland. As for England, the national bus strategy is offering very little chance for public consultation, so it's vital that we start to raise serious questions about it now. Many respected organisations like the Transport Select Committee, Centre for Cities and the CPRE here tonight have also recommended changing the legislation in the 2017 Bus Services Act. And this is vital if we're not to get trapped on a deregulated path for good. Changing the law for greater public control is increasingly being seen as the only way to solve Britain's bus crisis, but it will take public pressure and decisive action from MPs to push this through. So it's vital to get our representatives on board as soon as possible. Wherever you are in the UK, there's something you can do right now to help this report influence the discussion. When you leave the meeting tonight, please send an email to your MP, MSP in Scotland or MS in Wales. It doesn't have to be long, just a line with your personal reaction is enough and then a link to the report asking them to read it. 
that personal reaction is really important. And please tweet and talk about it on social media too, as we're really keen that it gets to the people it was written for. So that's all we've got time for today. And we just want to finish up by thanking everybody who's come along this evening. We've got nearly 150 people on the call, which is really amazing. And I want to say thank you to all the volunteers and campaigners who've been who've helped to put on tonight's event. We're going to be sending one follow up email to everybody who signed up via the Eventbrite. So please look out for that. Just reiterating some of these actions and to give you some details of your local public transport campaigns. We'd like to encourage you all to keep in touch and obviously to get actively involved in campaigning for the world class, affordable public transport service that we all urgently need. So thanks everybody. Let's have a virtual round of applause and bye. Thanks very much. It was a great pleasure. Bye. Thank you all.